So let's now consider our second example problem, which was part of speech tagging. So remember, in this case, each x is a history, um, which consists of a sentence. For example, we might have the dog saw the cat. We have some position i, which is the position being tagged. So let's say, for the sake of argument, it's position 4 in this case. So we're trying to estimate a distribution over potential tags for the word the. And then we have a sequence of previous tags, uh, t1 through ti minus 1. So we might, for example, have d, n, v as the context, the previous tags in the sentence before this fourth position. So each x encapsulates all of this contextual information, the entire sentence, the previous sequence of tags, and just for a little bit of bookkeeping, the position that we're actually tagging. Each label y is a part of speech tag, so it is going to be one of, say, 30 or 40 or 50 tags typically you might see in a given language. And again, we're going to assume that we have m features, f, k, x, y, each of these features is going to take an entire xy pair and return some real value. And again, we'll make heavy use of indicator functions, which return 0 or 1, depending on whether some property of x paired with y is true. Here are some example features, and these are actually taken from a part of speech tagger developed by Adwait Ratnaparki in the mid-90s, uh, which made direct use of log-linear models in a very elegant and effective way for tagging problems. Here are some example features. So f1 xy is 1 if the current word wy is the word base and the tag we're predicting is vt. So this looks at a word tag pair and for this particular feature we look at the word base in conjunction with the tag vt. In practice, you would again introduce a very large set of features of this form, basically for every possible combination of word and tag, or at the very least, every possible combination of word and tag that you've actually seen in your training data, assuming we have tag sentences to train the parameters of this model. So this is one clearly very important type of feature the feature that um, basically captures the tendency of a particular word to take a particular tag. You can think of this, if you think back to hidden Markov models, as being ana analogous to uh, E of base given VT, or at least when we see the parameter associated with this feature, that parameter is going to play a similar role to this emission parameter that you saw in hidden Markov models. Here's a more interesting feature, though, F2, as I've defined it here, is 1 if the word you're predicting ends in ing and the tag is vbg. This is a pen tree bank tag uh, reserved for verbs um, which are gerunds, so things like liking or talking. All of these uh, verbs in English which typically end in ing, and this feature is going to capture the tendency for words ending in ing to take this particular tag. Again, you might design a very large number of features like this um, for, say, all possible prefixes and suffixes combined with all possible tags, or again, at least those combinations which you've seen in training data. Actually, we can essentially give the full set of feature types that are used in Ratnaparki's tagger. It's a, it's a fairly simple set of definitions, so let me go through these. So he used uh, features which looked at the word and tag in exactly the same uh, as I've shown you on the previous slide. He used uh, spelling features which considered all prefixes and suffixes up to length 4 in conjunction with tags. So uh, here are some examples, you know, this feature we just saw conjoining ing as a uh, suffix together with bbg. Here's another feature which is one if the current word starts with the, the three-letter prefix pre 
and the tag is NN. And you can imagine these are just two features of a very large number, looking at all the prefixes and suffixes seen in training data in conjunction with all possible tags. Here are some other features that Ratna Parkey used. He used contextual features. So these are features which actually are analogous to the trigram tag uh, parameters you saw in HMM. So remember we had parameters such as this, which is the probability of seeing a transitive verb given the previous two tags, a determiner and adjective. The analogous feature to that is this feature, which is one, if ti minus two and t minus one and y form this particular trigram. Okay, so again, remember we have some sentence w1 through wn, for example, the dog saw the cat. We have some position we're tagging, for example, i equals four. And um, we have previous tags, t1 through t3, for example, equal to d and v. And so I can basically look at these previous two tags in conjunction with the label Y being predicted and create a feature like this, tracking a trigram of tags. This is the bigram feature. So it looks at the fact that TI minus one is JJ and Y is equal to VT. And finally, a unigram feature, which only looks at the label Y. And basically this will allow us to basically capture um, the relative frequency of different tags. Maybe VT is a frequent tag or not so, so frequent tag. This is the most naive feature because it conditions on no context, but of course it can be useful because it does provide some evidence that's very robust. We don't need to estimate, um, we don't need too much data to estimate the parameters associated with this feature. Here are some other features that Ratnaparki used. Here is a feature which uh, looks at the label Y, the fact that it's equal to VT, and it looks at the previous word. Again, this is going to be one feature of many which look at the previous word in conjunction with the current tag. This is very different from anything we saw in HMMs. We didn't see hidden Markov models making use of these features conjoining the previous word with the current tag, and indeed it would be quite, quite difficult to extend hidden Markov models to take into account this information. We have another feature which looks at the identity of the next word and the current tag, and again this would be one of many features which look at the next word and the current tag. So in summary, the final result of all this is the following. We can come up with practically any questions, what we've called features, which look at history tag pairs. And basically, for a given history x conjoined with a uh, label y, we get a feature vector and because our features have been indicator functions, binary functions that return 0, 1, we can sort of picture this as follows. f is going to take into account an entire history. So this is x. takes into account the sentence, position, the previous tags. And it considers a particular tag, um, for example, vt at the sixth position. And it just returns a binary vector um, summarizing the results of all the questions that we've asked about x and y together. And we get a different binary vector for every possible tag in the sixth position. Now I don't want to go into this in too much detail, but in practice these feature vectors are often sparse. In fact they're almost always sparse. Um, they have relatively few ones versus zeros. So while we might have a very large number of features in these models, it's not uncommon to have a few hundred thousand or a few million features. Typically, a much smaller number of those features are equal to one for any particular x-y pair. You might have, I don't know, in the order of a few tens of features, for example, which are equal to one because most of the questions we ask are going to be false and only some of them are going to be true. 
see the notes which are posted along with this lecture for much more discussion of this particular issue. And it's important because it leads to models which are rather more efficient than you might think, given the large number of features which are in these particular models.